Indeed. Yes. <laughs> we should survey. Okay, so here we go with the okay. introduction that Richard Berger made for us, especially for this. Isn't this a great intro? Well, once again, good morning <laughs> to you, good Timothy. Morning. We've <laughs> lost half done. our audience. <laughs> right. So we have quite a few people in Clubhouse already and also some people watching on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you very much for joining us on Sunday morning. This is January the 15th, 2023. We are here with Timothy Langley. Well, uh, quite uh, a long distance apart, but um, thankfully we have uh, the streaming services that uh, get us to together. Uh, you know, Timothy Langley is the CEO of Langley Esquire, so a consultancy in downtown Tokyo. And even though he doesn't look very serious when he dances, you can <laughs> bet that their services are the best in town. So, and of course, this is Japan Expert Insights. Japanese politics this morning. And, and Maya. Yes. <laughs> the the name of this briefing is called Japanese Politics One on One. Okay. I'm sorry for and, that. And, yes. Well, no, the reason why I'm saying that is because this is our 101 episode. Right. You're right about that. Oh, I didn't think about it. Thank you for reminding me that. And yes, this is the 100 and first episode That's of, this, right. yes, of this series. We don't count the, the episode in uh, seasons, but maybe we should start doing that, right? right? We have been going all the way, every week, every <laughs> Sunday morning. So I doubt that it's easy. Uh, well, we may, it may be difficult actually to you know, divide the episodes in into seasons, but that's how it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Timothy, for letting me know about that, reminding me that anyway. So uh, without any further ado, let's start, because I believe that there is a lot to talk, talk about today. Gosh, there's a lot to talk about. Every week, it just seems to be becoming uh, increasingly more difficult to report to everybody all of the important things that are going on. But let me give it a shot in 30 minutes, try and encapsulate the important things that you need to be watching if you're interested in what's going on in Japanese politics. So as everybody knows, Mr. Kishida, the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, traveled internationally all this last week. He visited Italy, France, uh, the UK, and Canada. And then at the end of that, he visited with Joe Biden yesterday. Um, he also had, um, you know, there was speculation. He received an invitation from the Ukraine embassy to come visit with uh, President Zelensky while he was on his uh, worldwide jaunt. Um, that apparently was uh, de declined, or I think just because of logistics, um, it was transferred into a telephone call, which they had um, uh, yesterday. So that is being reported in the press, too. Uh, there's a lot of speculation and um, thought going into why he visited uh, those four countries, but he didn't visit Germany. And there's also a lot of speculation about um, why he didn't go to visit with Mr. Zelensky because of the press coverage and the international impact that that would have generated. Uh, we can get into that, Maya, in the uh, Q&A because it's a really a pretty deep and you can, you can kind of understand a lot of different things going on within the Japanese government and their thinking on this. Um, but maybe we can push that off to the Q&A because I think it's a deep subject. Uh, what is. his trip was, where he went, how it was managed, that sort of thing. Let's do that. Yes, the Q&A okay. later. Yes. Okay. So the other thing that's going on with the, the prime minister, the, he's got a couple of things that he really needs to keep his eye on moving forward. You know, the diet starts its 150-day uh, ordinary session on the 23rd. That's the Monday after tomorrow. So in about eight days, that session will start off. 
the prime minister is now back in Japan and things will start really heating up. While he was away, you know, when the, what, what did they say? When the, the, the cat is away, the mice will play or something like the that. Mice will play, yes. <laughs> so th there, there was a lot of activity going on with members of his cabinet, mem influential people within the LDP um, while the prime minister was traveling and otherwise occupied. And it begins to show the building of a rift uh, within the LDP and um, kind of against Mr. Kishida. Uh, he's the top dog um, and people are very reluctant to raise their hand and say, you know, the prime minister doing a good job, but I think I could do a good job too. You might remember that Kono Taro suggested that very lightly um, before this um, election of uh, that he lost to Mr. Kishida, but before that, talking about Mr. Suga, and he got slapped down um, for making that kind of insinuation. So it's it's very unpolite um, or impolite, um, unpolitic to do that sort of thing here. And as a consequence, the typical Japanese reaction to the current prime minister, whether he stinks or whether he's good, is yes, well, he's the prime minister, but there's nobody else around that really kind of is, is close to uh, being that kind of a leader. They always say that. They always say that, um, you know, nobody's around that could do that. But in fact, there are. And the, in fact, um, every member of parliament joins the parliament because they want to become prime minister. Um, they don't join the parliament because they aspire to be just a member of, of the upper house or the lower house. It is all about becoming prime minister. So um, the... Uh, there were several visits uh, overseas. Mr. Suga was in Hanoi. Uh, Mr. Hagiuro was in, where was he? He was in, um, uh, I'm not sure what city he was in. Um, oh, he was on, he, he was uh, reported on, on a television uh, report. And then there was the, um, let me see, there was another um, influential member who was reported. So three different people in three different geographies talking about um, Mr. Kishida in a, in a very critical way. And the um, issue that's coming up now is that, um, and, and the way that criticisms are, are thrown are rather oblique, but when they're put together in a kind of a, a, a context, then you begin to understand the weight of it. So the, the criticism by um, Mr. Hagiuda, who is the policy affairs chief within the LDP, and probably uh, the next uh, leader of the Abe faction. He's one of the most prominent um, leaders in the council uh, since uh, the prime minister was, the former prime minister was assassinated. Um, and Mr. Suga, who was former prime minister, both said, you know, it's somewhat strange when somebody becomes prime minister, they usually give up their um, leadership within the faction that they lead. So it's almost always the leader of the faction who becomes prime minister, elected by uh, general acclaim within the LDP, since the LDP has the majority of votes within the lower house and the upper house. When it comes time to select a prime minister, the LDP generally gets to select that. And mm -hmm. within the LDP, it's the faction head who is, are, is going to be the candidate. In most instances, this last election, when Mr. Suga stepped down and it was uh, Mr. Kishida who led a faction, Kono Taro, who does not lead a faction, Sanai uh, Takai, Takaichi, who does not lead a faction, um, so, uh, and Noto Seiko, who does not lead a faction. So it's somewhat rare th in these last couple of elections, but in most instances, it is the um, faction head. So in Mr. Kishida's case, and in uh, typical Japanese history, if you become prime minister, you need to give up your party affiliation, not your party affiliation, but your, your factional affiliation, and let your number two guy become a titular head. So in Mr. Uh, Kishida's case, he hasn't given up there. His number two is Mr. Hayashi, who is the foreign minister. Um, and the criticism here is, He's just clinging on to power and he's um, benefiting his faction over the, uh, the general concerns of the LDP generally. 
and I think this is a, a swipe at him. His faction is the fifth largest. That means it is, it, it actually should be said uh, the opposite way. It is the smallest of the five major factions, um, which is pretty significant for him being the prime minister. That means he needs to kowtow to the other faction heads, which apparently he's not doing, which is generating this, this backlash. So um, in the grand scheme of things, I think it, it carries great impact. But when you look at it in isolation, it just seems to be maybe um, people, you know, just observing what the prime minister is doing and giving him advice on how we should change it. But the prime minister's got to focus on this 150 day diet session. He's got local elections coming up in April. He's got the G7 also in April. He's got um, this tax increase that he has to deal with. You might remember as we closed out the year, the defense spending was going to go from 1% to 2% without too much of a discussion. And as we closed out the year, they closed the diet and there was a little bit of time for politicians to be talking before everybody uh, closed down um, and went to their various uh, uh, constituencies. But um, the issue of how we're going to pay for this increase in defense spending uh, became a hot topic and it wasn't resolved. The prime minister said he's going to uh, raise, he's going to pay for this in uh, three or four components, um, in spending reforms, in selling assets, and in corporate taxes. Uh, and that also went without too much of a discussion. And uh, Mr. Suga in uh, Hanoi said, you know, he's not sure if he really agrees with the prime minister on the, this way to pay for defense spending. So this issue is just beginning to bubble up. It hasn't been decided. And when the diet starts in a week, uh, this will be a hot topic. The prime minister is also in a bit of a bind because he, you'll recall that he lost four ministers of state in two months and uh, the diet ended. He, he fired his last minister and now it's kind of in a limbo. What is he going to do as he m moves into the 150 day diet session? Um, the diet session, the no ordinary diet session is typically uh, devoted to passing the budget for 2024. Um, a lot of the issues that the diet dealt with before they closed out the year were um, cabinet recommendations for uh, defense spending, for the supplemental budget. They passed the supplemental budget. But their draft um, uh, recommendations that are going to be considered in the, new, in the new diet. So a lot of work has already been done. And to uh, revisit those and to make decisions requires that the diet is moving along smoothly. The, um, once again... It's the same thing that happened when they started the extraordinary diet session. Um, the LDP has said it wants to pass 60 bills. That's the same number of bills they said when they had the extraordinary diet session. They came nowhere close to it, but they're going to try again. And there's a lot of um, doubt that that is it's just pie in the sky because, number one, the ordinary diet session is almost completely devoted to passing the budget on April, even though the uh, budget deliberations end in April, there's still more time within the diet to talk about other bills. But as soon as the diet session ends, you've got the local elections that are, become, uh, that are going to come up. One of the complicating things about the local, diet, uh, the local um, elections throughout the country for mayors, governors, uh, for city um, councilmen, that sort of thing, is uh, this unification church issue. So it was a big problem for the national diet. And, you know, we lost one minister of state because of his ties with the Unification Church, which were not um, fully disclosed. And then uh, there was this big brouhaha about uh, various um, LDP members are required to describe to the LDP what their relationship was with the Unification Church and a promise to disengage from that. That's at the national level. At the local level, the Unification Church um, integration is far deeper and far stronger. So with the investigation that's going on right now in the Diet about the Unification Church, about um, how they were generating money, how they were integrating themselves in Japanese politics, is going to become more and more evident to the general public. And so there are a couple of issues with the general election. 
number one, um, the people who were supported by Cometo and find out what members are also being supported by uh, the Unification Church are going to be uh, considering what their options are for uh, voter registration and that sort of thing. So that's going to be a big issue. And the second big issue is what the Kishida administration decides on taxes. Nobody wants the taxes. Everybody agrees that defense spending is a good idea. 68% of the Japanese population agree that um, Japan needs to increase defense spending. Um, the debate is on how to pay for it. Um, the prime minister has um, promised that uh, bonds would not be included. He wants that to be kind of pay as you go along. And it's a, a pretty big hit to the, uh, the consumers um, to have to pay another uh, tax. Um, so they've got to conceal that somehow. Uh, the wages for Japanese um, workers has um, continued to fall over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and the consumer price index has continued to rise. So even though wages have increased several zero point whatever percent over the last couple of months, the consumer price index has risen so rapidly that uh, the report, the latest report coming out from uh, November, those are available to us now, show a 3.8% increase in uh, consumer prices. So that means even though the um, rate of uh, price w or, or wages has increased in some instances. Um, it's far uh, consumed by the uh, by the price in inflation. So uh, the prime minister has to deal with that too, and he's touting, you know, we're going to spend more money on defense. And by the way, your wages are dropping and the prices are going up. Um, he's got to do something about that. <clears throat> he has encouraged um, K. Dan Ren and major corporations to consider their uh, their wage policy, and it's beginning to take hold. You might have noticed that Uniqlo, one of the uh, clothing companies, a very major um, uh, clothing company in Japan, um, decided to increase their wages by 40%. That's a huge uh, jump. Uh, it made the news, and I think it's um, reflective of uh, what the prime minister is doing. You know, if, if you do this for me, I'm going to do something for you. So this increase in defense spending Part of it is going to be on corporate taxes, and I predict, and I think it's pretty accurate, to expect the prime minister will give certain um, benefits to those companies who have helped him by raising the prices of, or the, um, the salaries of their workers in anticipation of this. So you might see a little bit more of this coming on. The, the spring offensive is obviously starts in spring. It kind of everything you know, the fiscal year of Japan starts April 1st. So the spring offensive is in April and May. And um, this is a, coming at a bad time for the prime minister if he's looking ahead and he wants the LDP to continue to hold the reins of, of power. Um, so as a consequence of that, you might have remembered if you listened in our briefing last week, that uh, the Democratic People's Party is one of the opposition parties that the prime minister visited in their opening ceremony for the new year. This is very rare. It's an opposition party. The prime minister visited them when they held their big um, New Year's celebration in a major uh, Tokyo hotel. And uh, he's, he's kind of schmoozing up to the opposition party, which makes the Komeito party kind of scratch their head and say, wait, uh, we're, we're supposed to be a coalition. We're supposed to be friends. Um, you didn't ask me about inviting one of the opposition parties. And by the way, we hold our nose at a lot of the issues and the policies that you support because you support ours. But you bring in a third party, particularly somebody like the Democratic People's Party, that means we've got to hold our nose twice and we don't have as much leverage in negotiating with you. So we're not sure if we like this. And by the way, could you explain once again what your relationship is with the Unification Church? So you see that all of these things are building up uh, so the prime minister has got to make sure that the 150-day uh, diet session that starts in a week moves smoothly and he doesn't have all of this opposition that we see kind of signs of already while the prime minister was away. So um, the other thing that's kind of coming up now, no, no huge scandals for the prime minister, and I think if he can survive without any scandals, uh, he'll 
he's likely to serve out the rest of his term, or at least until the G7 is held in Hiroshima. And I think that's probably when um, real political alignment will be made. But there's also criticism now coming out about his chief cabinet secretary, who happens to be from the Abe faction. So once again, the Abe faction is beginning to make moves. If you're watching carefully, uh, the comments by Mr. Hagiura uh, criticizing the prime minister, and now this um, kind of subtle attack on the chief cabinet secretary. And the criticism uh, for him is uh, as follows. He's not very dynamic. He's not very active. He holds a press conference twice a week. He's not really taking charge on um, uh, critical issues, on solving problems. He stays in the background a lot. And he's also said that this is more in line with his personality. <clears throat> so this is a signal that if the prime minister is going to shuffle the cabinet, which is a small possibility, it's more likely that he might just remove one or two um, uh, cabinet officials, um, that in fact the chief cabinet secretary might be one of them. That's going to be a hard trick to pull because the Abe faction, when you get your seats within the cabinet, it is distributed somewhere along lines that uh, mimic your, your strength as a faction. Um, to have uh, uh, Mr. Matsuo pulled out and somebody else put in, especially if it's a Kishida faction member, that's going to cause real problems. So he's got that to deal with as well. <clears throat> um, you might recall that the defense spending um, is uh, a recommendation that was proposed as the diet closed. It's a huge uh, issue. The budget recommendation was um, for uh, 114 trillion yen for 2023. Uh, that's about um, 862 billion U.S. dollars. Um, in 2022, the defense spending was uh, just one point. They, they keep saying that it's 1% or there, there was a taboo not to go over uh, 1% in, in uh, former administrations. In fact, in 2022, the defense spending for Japan was at about 1.24%. So it had already expanded without um, you know, too much of a, a debate going on there, sneaking up on people, I think but also uh, just dealing with the realities of what's going on with China and North Korea. But uh, for 2023, um, the budget will, the defense budget will go from 5.4 trillion yen to 6.8 trillion yen. Um, that's almost a 27% increase. So if the overall goal is to increase defense budget uh, spending from uh, one percent of GDP to two percent of GDP, they are front loading a lot of that to the defense ministry just this year. And uh, hell is going to be uh, paid not this year for uh, the consumers, but in 2024 because the prime minister has said he's not going going to increase taxes to pay for defense spending this year. We get a ride this year, but he will um, increase those taxes next year when he's more, it's more likely that he's not even going to be there. He's, he's going to be a, just a regular diet member, maybe a cabinet minister, <clears throat> but apparently still head of the uh, Kishida faction. So um, we've got that going on. <clears throat> um, the corporate taxes that are going to be imposed, um, so it's, it's about a trillion yen, uh, one fourth of the defense increase will be hoisted on consumers and um, the Japanese government will take care of part of that. Um, that will be represented in uh, corporate taxes, uh, a tobacco tax, and um, let me see, in uh, the, the reconstruction of to Tohoku, they have a, a, a tax that is being accumulated ever since the disaster uh, 10 years ago. <clears throat> it it uh, um, accounts for about 2.1%. They're going to take 1% of that, and instead of having this um, additional tax for 30 years, they're going to spread it out to 50 years. So they're doing a little bit of a shell game there. But with regard to uh, the corporate taxes, the small and medium companies are unlikely to get that hit. It's going to go to the large corporations, which 
account for about 6% of all corporations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the taxes are going to increase, and because taxes are increased, the uh, uh, producers typically pass those taxes on to, um, to the, uh, the consumers. So you've got that uh, to look forward to. Um, so 2023 is going to be a, a tough year for the prime minister. It's going to be instructive. What he does over the next maybe two months, if we get to, through two months, maybe in the next month or so, um, or watching what's going on within the diet. The other interesting thing that's going on is, um, you remember the prime minister was assassinated, and that meant that his diet seat is open. And his brother-in-law, uh, uh, Kishi, Nobuo Kishi, also is in the same uh, general uh, district in Yamaguchi. And he's decided that he's going to retire from politics. He was the defense minister under the um, Abe and Suga administrations. He retired. And then he just announced he's going to retire from politics. That puts <clears throat> two, two diet seats open for a, um, a general election. So with, um, if, if a, a diet seat is um, vacated, within 90 days, there needs to be a by-election there. The prime minister was assassinated and they need to have a by-election. And then Mr. Kishi uh, resigned and they have to have a by-election. That by-election will be held on the same date in April. Um, this is a very rare uh, occurrence for uh, two members in the same uh, election district to have to go up. The other kind of uh, complicating factor here is we haven't talked much about 1010. 1010 is a, um, the number 10-10. It is the description of the gerrymandering that is going on for the election of members of the House of Representatives. It is a new gerrymandering law that will go into effect from January 1st. <clears throat> the funny thing is, for replacing Mr. Abe's seat, since he died before January 1st, the election of his district, even though it's on the same day, will be held under the previous gerrymandering rules, whereas his brother, Mr. Uh, Kishi, when he goes for election, will be under the new rules of 1010. So it's something to really look out for. Um, it will be a kind of a, a telegraphing point of what's going to happen when the next diet session or the diet uh, election is called. Um, and that's also uh, something that uh, the pundits are looking at now that the prime minister may close down the house. Um, I don't think he'll do that right now. He just doesn't have the wind in his sails. You might have thought that going on an a international trip on something that he's really good at, diplomacy and geopolitics, that when he comes back, he's got a lot of wind in his sails. And then he says, you know, I'm going to close down the house, vote for me. I'm doing a great job. I don't think that that's in the cards. So uh, we're going to be watching very closely what he does with his cabinet appointments. If his cabinet approval doesn't in improve. Um, there's no prime minister that has survived um, with uh, cabinet approval at 30 percent where the prime minister is now. They just had a recent poll. You know, uh, NHK had a poll last week where it's uh, it's lost. He's lost more credibility on um, the appreciation of his administration by the voters. And no, no prime minister has survived um, that length of time at those numbers. So um, there's a lot of fireworks to be uh, anticipated there. Um, there's also a lot going on with, um, let me see, what's my next point here? Uh, we we're talking about the internal dynamics. Tado Aso is uh, the um, leader of the second, uh, the third biggest uh, political faction. He made a, a comment in Fukuoka just this last week about the LDP being completely unified in raising taxes to pay for the defense spending and that the LDP is all together on that. That immediately caused dissension within the LDP ranks. He's a powerful figure. He was a, a vice prime minister. He was minister of finance. He's now vice president of the LDP. He's a very popular powerful figure, probably powerful is the more 
an accurate term. Um, but this, this criticism now being lodged against him tells you that there's a little bit of an instability going on within the LDP. And so the, the stage is being set for some sort of dis potentially uh, disruptive activity on a kind of collective basis. So um, the prime minister visited uh, the United States. He visited the United States. His defense secretary and his foreign secretary met with, um, they had a two plus two. They met with um, uh, Lloyd Austin and Tony Blinken. Uh, two days for two days before the prime minister came. So the prime minister met with uh, Joe Biden the next day. So this, this increasingly buildup of, of forces uh, is just going on unabatedly. Um, they have decided to further integrate the military operations between Japan and the United States. And this is ramping up the kind of the direction is coming from, seems to be coming from the United States. The uh, Japanese government cannot hire more self-defense forces, even in light of the fact that they're increasing uh, the budget by 100%. So it's kind of like what's going on with Ukraine. They give Ukraine lots of money, lots of equipment, lots of, lots of strategic resources. Um, it's, it's hard to digest all of that in such a, a short period of time. That's the same um, issue that Japan is having. Um, so it looks like, I, I don't know, the systems and the operations, um, at least in the short term, needs to be managed by uh, the United States or by uh, foreign allies because uh, they're very sophisticated. And if you don't have the, um, you know, in-ground uh, education and experience on dealing with these, uh, it's hard to develop that. So one of the important things that is somewhat worrying is, you know, the United States and Japan have this special relationship, the Status of Forces Agreement, which allows the stationing of U.S. troops on Japanese soil. It's a very unique uh, relationship. It's been in effect for 70 years. Um, in the 1960s, when they extended that agreement, it caused riots. Um, you know, Tokyo University, the University of Tokyo was, was uh, on fire. It was just, it was huge demonstrations everywhere. Um, it now appears that when he was in uh, England, he signed a similar agreement with the prime minister there for uh, stationing of troops um, reciprocally. That means that Japanese forces can now be stationed in uh, England for training and for um, defense purposes, but stationed there, um, not, not like on a tourist visa, but actually uh, being stationed there. And similarly, um, British forces can come to Japan um, and be stationed here too, similar to what the United States has. Uh, the um, Australian government has also requested similar um, um, rights to do that. Uh, that's in, in consideration now. So we've said this before on this briefing that the Japan that we know today is going to be vastly different from the Japan that we know in five years. It's just in, inescapable. So you've got to watch how these things are developing and appreciate, you know, number one, um, the, the issues that Japan is confronting. Japan would never have considered this, would have never moved forward like this uh, without some um, outside threat as, as usual. But these are big moves, they're significant, they really impinge on the interpretation of the Japanese constitution. The prime minister has avoided the issue, but he has said in an interview that he had with um, Yomiuri uh, at the close of the year, that it is his intention to change the constitution within the term of his um, presidency of the LDP. So uh, that's a, a pretty significant statement. Uh, basically, I think Mr. Suga and Mr. Abe said the same thing, but um, it always is an issue to have uh, the constitution changed so that it can become eventually a, a Japanese constitution rather than a constitution that was imposed by uh, U.S. forces, which is the general um, conception of what the current constitution represents. So when you think of that, he still needs to have two-thirds in the upper house, two-thirds in the lower house, and the local elections approaching, and the unification church being criticized, and his relationship with 
komeito. All of these things just are really a, a mishmash of, of um, conflicts that uh, he has to deal with. So um, we look forward to that. Um, it's not going to be resolved. It's just going to be um, a continuing um, uh, spectrum of, of change. And it's going to be very fast and it's going to be um, very deep. So stay tuned for that. One of the other things that's happened over this last week, um, and I think it's part of a, a global trend, is that Japan has ceased issuing uh, tourist visas, travel visas, uh, to China. So if people are coming in from China, they have to have a COVID test issued within the last 72 hours. But I think that is pretty much cover for a, a blanket uh, rejection of uh, tourists and business people coming from, uh, from China. That's happening in Europe and in the United States as well. If you're Russian, you are already ha suffering from that. You're very limited in your ability to travel. And this is now being imposed uh, on China as well. So the screws are becoming tightened and the status of forces of like-minded countries is beginning to become more and more affirmed. The G7 presidency is Japan's this year. And the presidency of the G7 uh, gets to decide two things, importantly. They get to decide the agenda, and they get to decide invitees. So um, the prime minister is now uh, publicly considering um, inviting uh, Prime Minister Yoon or President Yoon from South Korea to come in. That's a, that's a pretty big deal for him to extend that, that um, olive branch to come in. We still don't have the decision of the um, acquisition of Japanese corporate assets in uh, South Korea to pay for reparations. Um, so this, this kind of tug of war still continues there. I'm sure when the prime minister was in Washington, D.C., he also heard uh, the, the desire of the United States for Japan and South Korea to somehow bury this hatchet and to work more collaboratively together they are important members of the Quad. They're the closest allies in the region. Um, they are the ones that are most um, directly confronted by what's going on in uh, North Korea. And so the importance of these two nations coming together is, uh, couldn't be overemphasized. So the United States wants that and is making a lot of effort to um, encourage Japan to, to make that um, uh, possible. The other thing that in context with that and with the, the defense spending, um, you might have heard uh, the bonds are not going to be a part of this defense spending, except with regard to uh, structures and construction and perhaps um, barracks for soldiers. They did put that aside. And uh, over the last two weeks, once again, it's happening so rapidly that you've just got to keep your eye on what's going on. Over the last couple of weeks, there has been um, reports of uh, uh, site visits and um, surveys on the outlying islands of Okinawa for storage of weapons, for uh, ammunition dumps, for depots, for that sort of thing. It's increasing at an incredible pace. And once you look into the issue a little bit, um, let me see what they've got. They've uh, got 1,400 sites throughout Japan where they keep um, weapons, where they keep, they store uh, ammunition and material. They have uh, barracks and that sort of thing. Of this 1,400 sites, 70% of them are located in Hokkaido. And if there's going to be a uh, connective action, a uh, kinetic action um, going forward, that's a long way from where all the action is expected to be in the Southern Islands. Uh, so they're now pushing very hard to uh, create new sites on these islands. Some of them are actually even um, uh, uninhabited. Um, and some of them, um, you know, the people just don't want that sort of thing happening. They're islands, their space is limited. And to have the Japanese government come in and uh, plow some land, move some mountains, and build uh, some structures there, it, it's worrisome because they obviously become a target too. So... Um, their voice in determining this is going to be a, a weighty factor, but obviously the Japanese government needs to move in that direction. And um, 
um, the the uh, construction of these is and the um, embellishment of these. So the other thing that's going on with the self defense forces and the increase in the budget, as you might have heard, the uh, coast guard, which is typically a different kind of animal than the self defense forces. The coast guard is coastal protection and they're uh, kind of uh, traffic cops for the waterways and monitoring uh, uh, sea traffic and the sea lanes and that sort of thing. They're not generally armed. And the self-defense forces is under the Ministry of Defense. Um, and they have guns and uh, are tasked with protecting and defending um, the Japanese mainland. They're going to bring those two together. So the uh, uh, Coast Guard system, the entire system, is now being amalgamated onto the self-defense forces. So um, uh, probably in the, the very near term, the Coast Guard will be um, a different force than it is now. Certainly, they've got to change their culture. It'll be a difficult transition for them. And um, it's, it's not um, unexpected that they would uh, be armed in the near term. So there's a lot going on there. Um, 90 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 90 of the uh, depots and uh, constructions in the southern islands will be for Navy use. And uh, 40 of them that are under construction or consideration right now will be for the self-defense forces. So there's a little bit of a distinction there, and it looks like the Navy is getting the lion's share of that. Um, let me see, where else are we going? You might have noticed that the Bank of Japan increased their yield for bonds uh, just this last week. This was the second time that the Bank of Japan made a movement. They made a movement earlier in, um, in December. It shook the markets up. Um, they made another move just this last week and the yen dollar ratio now stands at one point, uh, 128 yen to the dollar. 128, what's the exact number? 128.24. Uh, this is incredible. Um, you know, uh, two months ago, it was in the 140s. It was causing a panic. Um, the yen value was uh, becoming cheaper and cheaper. Um, Foreign tourists were coming in, taking advantage of that. That was a good deal for them. And now the yen is pegged at about 128. So what's going on in the Bank of Japan? Um, they have not anticipated with the um, transition of Mr. Kuroda, uh, the, the president of the Bank of Japan, not being rotated out until April. His term of office ends in April, that there would not be much of a move there. With these two moves now, it looks like either there's going to be a change in the policy um, how the, the Bank of Japan uh, deals with the yen value and the easy money policy, or there might be a, a change in leadership, which probably is unlikely. The president is selected by the prime minister, as you know. So um, how that is going to be um, um, rolling out over the next couple of weeks, I think you'll see um, some tremendous movement there. When the bond market moves like that, uh, it increases the value of the yen. It's good for some people. It's bad for other people. Um, every time the yen increases in value, it does impact the amount of money uh, since there's so much debt that they need to pay for servicing the debt. The debt in, um, let me see, in, um, in Japan, as you might know, is about 160 times the GDP. That's how much debt Japan holds. And um, let me see. The report says that um, servicing the national debt already cost the government over 20 trillion yen, which is about um, 151 billion yen per year. That's just servicing the debt. And if the interest rate were to rise by 1%, and it looks like it's risen 0.5%, that it would have to fork out an additional 3.7 trillion yen, which is approximately 28 billion yen per year. That's an additional 28 billion yen per year to service the debt. That means it's not generating anything. That's half of what their budget would be for um, the entire um, uh, military budget that uh, the diet will be considering and, and passing probably this, um, this diet session. So that's just for servicing the debt. So 
every time there is an increase, some people benefit and some people don't. Don't and the Japanese government in servicing the debt that they have accumulated is reluctant to kind of do that, even though the consumers might benefit from it. So it's it's one of those other issues that the prime minister needs to to keep an eye on. And finally, you might have noticed, um, and I think this is in line with uh, Mr. Biden's trip to the United States and the discussion on better integration of the United States and Japan's self-defense forces. It will now include not only uh, cyber, but also um, space. So they want to go into outer space for, um, for joint projects with uh, defense capabilities. And this, um, this push for um, ships and um, manufacturing wafers here in Japan, TSMC, uh, is in joint venture with Sony, as you know, a tremendous $1.1 trillion, um, trillion yen uh, factory that they're building in uh, Kumamoto. Um, they've come back um, to the table now, and it looks like um, they're going to have a second TSMC factory. This flies on the, the heels of the prime minister's visit. And also, Rapidus is this um, uh, conglomeration of Japanese major companies to build uh, highly advanced uh, chips um, in the very near term that's on um, r rocket speed. And IBM was just included in that as well. So um, the United States' highest um, uh, advanced technology on chips is now binding with the Japanese. It looks like there will be a second factory built in Japan, which means there'll probably be a second one somewhere in Arizona or Nevada uh, in the United States as well. But uh, things are really going gangbusters here, removing... Um, the ability of the Chinese to travel and also removing their ability to have access to the advanced chips and wafers. This hurts Japan in a couple of ways because the, the Japanese manufacturers sell a lot of these manufacturing processes and machines and highly uh, technical uh, devices to China. They make a lot of money doing that even though they're not as robust in making the chips themselves. Um, and the United States is pressuring them to to back off from that and just focus on uh, the like-minded countries. Um, so that's a, a worrying thing. And finally, um, not to close out on a dour note, but two years ago it was decided that in two years' time, uh, the Fukushima water would be released. That two years' time is now approaching. Probably in the spring, uh, TEPCO will be releasing in uh, measured uh, allotments uh, the uh, tremendous amount of stored uh, waste water and contaminated water in uh, in Fukushima. So that is another issue. It's going to occur around uh, the election time, local elections. Probably they'll push it off after the local elections, but it is now a public um, uh, pronouncement. It is something that um, you can look forward to and probably in public debate will increase as we approach that date. Maya, that's about it for me. Uh, there's a lot more that I could talk about, um, but I think I've gone a little bit over over time um well yeah um you're actually within the limits don't worry yeah. so <laughs> you can yes uh you can relax now but thank you so very much for this and uh, of course let's move to clubhouse today again so that uh, we can talk about uh, oh 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 no <laughs> okay <laughs> just for a second i thought that you were going really into yeah, the water I I could feel you kind of pushing me there, so. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay, so with this, uh, thank you for the live stream. And uh, let's move to Clubhouse and let's continue with uh, the Q&A session there. I'll see you over there. 